announcement. Uh, it's not really an announcement, but I want to congratulate our friend WTOM. Oh, I think it's 04. He's been on my channel for years. His son got baptized today as a believer. And by the way, it's believer's baptism. He realizes he was already saved and he wanted to make a public proclamation of his faith. So after he was baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, he wanted to do water baptism to show that he died, was buried, and rose again in newness of life in the power of Jesus' resurrection uh, publicly. So he did that today. He was looking for a church for a long time. And it just so happens that my pastor's wife's dad has a church in their area. And so I was uh, congratulating him for taking that public step to proclaim his faith. And so uh, we are, uh, I'm very proud of you, little brother. I'm very, very happy about that. Uh, so I'm happy to be here with you guys. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, Tom, Brother Tom, WTOM04, if that's the right one, I think uh, you're saying it correctly. Uh, yeah, I remember Tom from way back. And uh, Tom, I'm happy about that baptism. And uh, if anybody uh, is a believer and you have not had a public baptism a ceremony, I would encourage everybody to really th think and pray about getting that done. Not because it's necessary, but most people will never have a better opportunity to witness and share the gospel than on that public baptism where you can invite your friends and family. And uh, the baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So it's, uh, it's a presentation of the gospel for everybody. So if you haven't done it, I hope you'll get that done. In the chat room, they were saying it was muted for a little bit. How long were we muted? Just for, for just for a few minutes. Oh, um, right, right, and, okay. and Luke, uh, the pro you you recommended a checklist, which I actually do have. Uh, but the problem is that the unmute button is so small that when you click it, it's hard to tell that you actually clicked it. But <laughs> it, just, it, it just occurred to me that I could add something to the checklist to say, okay, after I uncheck it, do I see the sound meter moving? And so uh, I will add that to the checklist. Oh. Shouldn't happen again. <clears throat> All right, very good. Uh, is there um, anything that uh, was muted out that is necessary to be repeated uh, that was said, you think? No, no, not really. Ren uh, Renee was talking about her twisted sister um, ideas. Oh, yeah. I can't wait till yeah, that's done. Uh, Renee, when you get the right uh, thumbnail and uh, backdrop for your channel and graphics and oh, it's going to be fantastic when that's really uh, done to, and, you know, as we've, as we've imagined it. It's... All right. Um, Brother Ben, what I, do you think? I guess well, I don't know if you would have to do like a separate little three second animated thing or just a, a, a a playing graphics thing with music over it or something. I'm not sure, but maybe we can figure that out. Well, why not ask the congregation to uh, think about it? And maybe we have some creative people in the congregation that could uh, come up with some ideas or help. Um, Ben's going to do it. But um, if you have some good ideas to submit to Ben, uh, then uh, that would be fantastic. We What we want is some kind of a graphic that would illustrate the uh, the concept of the untwisted sister. Yeah. Um, all right, Ben, why don't you say hi to the congregation? Hello, everyone. It's uh, looking forward to the service today. We got a lot of great questions. Uh, I'm anticipating some great answers, and I'm just great grateful to be with you all today. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Um, I guess we need to uh, discuss the, the prayer needs now. Uh, I did not receive any uh, prayer requests mailed in uh, this week, uh, so I'm not aware of anything new. Uh, Sister Renee, what have you got to tell us? A prayer request? Yes. Well, I want to keep praying for MG. Uh, he's looking for a job. Uh, I want to keep praying for KC. She has a nonprofit business. Uh, she asked me 
to lift her business and her up in prayer. Uh, I want to continue praying for our friend in Australia, you know, seeker of light. Um, we want to keep praying for him and his mom. Uh, Anthony Suarez, keep praying for his kidney transplant. Uh, Jennifer Petty, uh, she's got terrible health. She's been disabled and her mother recently died and she takes care of two small children and uh, she's got a lot of health issues. So we want to pray for her. Martha Ferrer in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we want to pray for a good report for her. And strangely enough, th look, you guys, my friend Sam is the most offensive person and he likes it. I mean, he says things offensively on purpose for attention. But he's in his 50s and he takes care of his dad. He's a Jew, but he's an atheist. And he's constantly saying how it's all nonsense. He's really funny. He sends me mail from Moses. It'll say from Moses, the lawgiver, to Renee, the Jesus freak, you know. Yet, uh, he had us pray for his father a while back. I don't know if you guys remember. Sam Shore, we were praying for his father to be healed of cancer. And he was. Uh, and he claimed if he got healed that he'd believe. But he doesn't. You can't make somebody believe. But strangely, they uh, are needing to move. And he's scared that he's not going to be able to find a place within their means. You know, in California, a one bedroom goes for 1500 So, um, and that's on the low end. So he's a little bit scared. So he asked us, Jesus freaks, <laughs> to pray that they get an apartment. Uh, so we're going to pray that they get a good apartment uh, for a good price for him and his father to move into. I find it interesting that people will, will say they don't believe in it, yet they see their prayers getting answered when people of God pray for them. And so they come back and ask for more prayer. Uh, and I'm glad. I'm glad. He can tease me all he wants and I pick on him too. Uh, but there's something working here. I feel something at work with Sam. And I'm showing him in the Torah. I'm using the scriptures that him and his father are allowed to read. I show him in the Torah and then the prophets who Jesus is when I get a chance. So uh, I'm working on him and God's working on his heart. So let's keep them in prayer, you guys. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good report. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, ben, uh, could you tell us uh, any uh, prayer needs that you know about, and including in the chat room? If yeah, I, I don't know. I think Renee mentioned this, but MG still looking for a job. Uh, that's all that I saw. Uh, we're going to be addressing a specific question uh, that is kind of uh, a prayer request as well. Um, and if you, I would ask if you could help, uh, if you would pray for my family who are steeped in Catholicism and just generally uh, blind um, to many things. And I, I would ask if you could pray for their, their heart to be softened and to see the truth. And that's all I have this week. All right, then. Okay, I don't see any anything uh, additional. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this now. We're going to take 30 seconds, and I'm asking the whole congregation to uh, pray for all of these needs now. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, 
Well, uh, I might as well show you my shirt before we get going. You've seen it before. This is a shirt that uh, Joy Palmquist got for me many years ago when I first started the YouTube channel. I don't know if she created this somehow or if it's a YouTube. I can't imagine YouTube producing a shirt like this, but it's a play on the words of YouTube. God wants you to be saved. That is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen that anywhere else? No, I haven't. It's really cute. Yeah. Also, Mark Dakota, Dakota uh, would like prayers for his father's uh, struggle with Lyme disease. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Lyme disease. Are they from Connecticut? That's where my wife is from, and they everybody seems to get that back there. You're right. I know people with Lyme disease in Connecticut as well. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, all right. Let me see. There's no communion today. That's the first Sunday. That'll be next Sunday. Um, and oh, what about some uh, hymns, brother? Uh, can you... Uh, Help us out yes. with that, Brother Ben? Yes, would you like to do that now? Yes, please. Okay.
it down Well, I'm going to the river of Jordan Bury my knees in the sand Gonna holler high, Hosanna Till I reach that promised land Cause there ain't no grave
with shout of acclamation to take me home. What joy shall fill my heart, and I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim. Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. That uh, particular channel that uh, provides these uh, hymns for us and the video, they uh, they do such a good job on that, and they they are allowing us to use it free without any kind of royalties, and they are encouraging us to and others to use it. Uh, but they've got some kind of a store where they sell some artwork, I suppose. I, I love their style. I was just saying I want to use their style artwork for the, for the storyboard slides for my trailer. Mm, awesome. Yeah, so I, I'm just going to encourage everybody to go to that uh, channel and, and uh, check it all out and, and see if you can't uh, support them somehow since they're, uh, they're so gracious to uh, provide this for us. A lot of talent and work and so much uh, effort and probably expense was put into producing those and, and we get to and use them and enjoy them free. All right. Um, okay, I guess we've covered everything apart from the, um, uh, the questions. So are you ready to go into the first question, everybody? Raring to go? Ready yes, to go. Sir. Ready to go. Okay, first question is, um, I have a friend who is gay and she knows it's wrong, but she chooses to date women regardless of what the Bible says. She says she believes in God and Jesus, but she is still not sure whether she will go to heaven or not. Does the Bible teach that I should walk in friendship with this person or to turn away? Uh, bad company corrupts good morals. However, she's a very kind person. I don't know if I should be her friend or not. Uh, there were actual, uh, actually a couple of letters we received uh, uh, from this person uh, on the, regarding this subject, this problem. And uh, so we, we moved this question to the front of our list today because I thought this is urgent. This is something that needs to be addressed right away see if we can't give her some counseling on this on this uh, problem. Uh, all right, Sister Renee, any words of wisdom? Yes, I'm trying to pull up a verse here. Uh, First Corinthians, hold on one second. I'm looking up something specifically. Uh, King James, okay. All right, now, I want to address a couple of things. One, 
telling this person you can't be their friend anymore because they're gay will push her as far away from Jesus as possible. It comes across as self-righteous. Sorry, I know a lot of people would disagree. However, the reason I say that is because it sounds like she's not saved. If she doesn't know she's going to heaven, then she's not believing on Jesus. If she says, oh, I believe in Jesus, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, she doesn't understand or re hasn't received the gospel. So first things first here, you need to tell this child that God loves very much, that he died for her, regardless of what her lifestyle is, regardless of what sin she commits, that Christ shed his blood for her, and that we can know we have eternal life and get her saved. You know, let the give her the good news. Of course, God saves her, but you know, give her the good news. Then she will have the Holy Spirit. Then her behavior becomes an issue. Okay. We only deal with other people's lifestyles within a congregation. We don't care what the world is doing. We, we're not here to morally reform lost people. Okay. We're here to preach the gospel, the good news of God's love for them. So first things first, she needs to hear and understand the good news of the gospel of her salvation and be saved. We can't ask an unregenerate person to deny their flesh. They don't have the spirit. They don't have the desire nor the power to do so. It would be a struggle in her flesh to go against what her flesh wants, okay? So she needs to be saved. If you come across with a, I can't be your friend anymore because you're gay, that will push her far, far away from coming to the Lord. And it's not what we're supposed to do. Now, I pulled this verse up about dealing with sexual immorality, but it's within the body of Christ. And Paul says, you know, we're not worried about what the world does that we don't go out there. That's what drives me crazy when these people repent or perish. You got to stop being gay before, you know, that doesn't, the repent verse there is Jesus telling people, stop being self-righteous and thinking you're less of a sinner because the tower didn't fall on your head, you know? So the thing is here, uh, the, the good news has to be preached. She needs to be saved and you need to show her kindness and unconditional love that God showed us. We don't go out condemning people because their sin is different than ours. You know, a lot of these people think they don't sin anymore, but they still get, they're still lazy. They still have apathy. They still watch TV too much. They still overeat. They still get in their flesh. They still get resentment. They still get all the stuff in their flesh everybody else does, and they just won't admit it to themselves. They're just deceived. So, Again, we're not here to morally reform the unsaved. We're here to preach the gospel to the lost. And then once they're saved, then we worry about behavior because they're part of the body of Christ. And now it's our business. Okay. It's not our business outside of it. Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians 5, yet not all together with the fornicators of this world. All right. It says here, I wrote you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now, here's the difference. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So he says, I'm not fussing at you about uh, what the world's doing. You'd have to leave the planet to, to get rid of the sin out there. Okay. So we're not trying to change the unsaved. We're trying to get the unsaved saved. And then God works on their behavior. Most people have this backwards. They're trying to get lost people to change their behavior. Uh, and Brother Luke and I studied the warrant of faith with a, a Spurgeon who comes against this harshly and says, no, there is no warrant except the command to believe on Jesus. There's nothing that you've got to do before you come to Christ. You come just as you are. You don't change a thing. You don't try to clean yourself up. You don't get yourself well before you come to the doctor. So he says this, not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, 
for then must ye needs go out of the world. So we're not worried about them. We'd have to leave the world to get around away from them. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunk, or extortioner with such a one not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away among yourself that wicked person. So if they're not in the body of Christ, God judges them. You don't. You don't go out there condemning these people. Okay. They are judged by God. Now, in a fellowship atmosphere, if the, if someone is called a brother that is saying, nope, I know it's wrong. I'm going to stay in it anyway. I don't care. Well, if they if they do that, that's another issue. But if they're struggling with it, we're supposed to help them and be patient, not not condemn them, because we know that their heart desires change and they're just struggling against their flesh. That's a separate issue. We don't beat them down when they're trying to to grow. OK, but if somebody is a brother and says, no, nope, I know God hates it. I know it's sinful. I'm going to stay in it anyway. Doesn't mean they're not saved. It just means that they're babes in Christ and they have no desire to fellowship with the Lord. And if that's the case, we're not to eat with them one. So your question about being her friend, of course, you should be kind to her and give her the gospel. We are not to judge those that are without. God judges them. We don't judge them. The only time we have an issue with someone's behavior is if they're called a brother. So that's the answer. Well, you said that's the answer, and I say amen. That really is the answer. I, you, I think you covered all the bases uh, very thoroughly and perfectly. Uh, so I can say a amen to your whole answer. Um, there, there are some key points that you covered that I'll, I'll kind of just emphasize again. We, we can discern that this person is not a believer, uh, even though she it says that she believes in God and, and it says that uh, it believes in God and believes in Jesus. But even believing that God does exist and that Jesus did exist. He's real. He was a real person. And, and even if she believes that Jesus is God in the flesh and he's son of God and he died on the cross for her sins and our sins, even that level of belief uh, is not what is needed. She, she has to believe that he paid for her sins and because he paid for her sins and because he has power over life and death, he proved that by raising himself from the dead, that uh, that he, he does have the power to give eternal life, and he promises her eternal life. Uh, so if, if she comes to the point where she, she believes that uh, she is going to go to heaven, uh, she does have eternal life guaranteed to her by Jesus, that, then we will look at this differently. But uh, it, it's clear that from the information we have here, uh, we can safely say that she's not a believer in the gospel and, and the saving message of Jesus. Uh, so that does uh, make a difference in a way, the way that uh, we're going to view this problem. And uh, yeah, amen, Renee, that there, if, if someone is uh, not a believer, um, uh, I believe Paul is the one that emphasized this, this makes this distinction that, uh, we're not to judge them. Uh, uh, obviously, we, we can make a judgment. Uh, we, we're always judging every day. Uh, people say the non-believers, especially the atheists, um, there's one verse in the Bible they all know. It's judge not lest ye be judged. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't the Bible say judge not? So um, the only thing, Bible Jim told me once, he said, the, the only thing people do more than, than a breathing is judging. And we all judge all day long. We're making judgments and uh, we need to. So the Bible says that 
not that we're not supposed to judge, but we, we need to make learn to make righteous judgments. Um, but we're not going to judge someone uh, on their the way they're living their life. And, and as far as uh, if they're not in the church, if they're not a believer, then it's not our place. We're not supposed to be concerned with that. We should be concerned with the fact that they're not a believer. That is the priority. Nothing else matters until we can share the gospel. And, and, uh, and then when they do become a believer, then it does change everything. But the, the idea that uh, of not being friends with uh, someone uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, that would be a big mistake because you don't have the opportunity to, to witness them if you've just shunned them. But also, uh, Jesus said that don't take a, a light and put it underneath the table. You put the light on top of the table so that it can, it, only then does it have value is it actually sh showing, spreading light to the world. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to hide uh, and withdraw from the world. We're supposed to be in the world and we should be so different that we stand out like a sore thumb because our light in the darkness is obvious. Um, and then that should stimulate conversations. I've had many people ask me, why, why is it you're always so fantastic? Every time I ask you how you're doing today, you say you're fantastic. And so when people can see that uh, you're a living example of this joy and peace that we have as believers, uh, they can get curious and wanna know what's going on with you, you're different. That should be an obvious thing that the world sees in us. And they're not gonna see it if we withdraw and we're not. Now there is a verse, and um, maybe we could discuss that, but it, it says that uh, 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 if you're uh, friends with the world, you're at en enmity with God, I believe it says. Uh, I'd have to look at the context to see but you know, how to explain that. But the um, um, obviously when we go into the world, we need to make sure we're not conforming to the world. Matter of fact, Romans 12, 12, that shirt I wear that says uh, um, uh, heavy drinker, it, it says, uh, be not conformed to the world. Uh, you, let's not conform to them. Let, let's, let's go in the world and let our example, when they see the difference in us, that should be an example so that maybe they'll get curious, they'll believe, and then they will have the Holy Spirit conform them or transform them so that they're in line with what God wants. Um, I think uh, now, if someone is a believer though, let me ask you, in this case with this particular woman, does anybody think that the only sin in her life is uh, uh, lesbianism? Is that the only sin that she's she's committing? <laughs> That's what they, they, for some <laughs> reason, put a spotlight on that one thing, yeah. It, it, let's say that she was not a lesbian. She's not had one lesbian thought her whole life. Still lost. Okay. Still lost. The, the, yeah. The, if we if we uh, were to uh, put it, her life under a microscope, we would soon discover another grievous sin in her sure. life. Sure. Uh, That's what she don't get. Even if she was able through forcing her flesh into denying what she desires, she'd still be lost. That's the whole point. Like you said, let your light shine. And the whole thing about being in the world, it doesn't mean you can't love people that are lost. My goodness. It's conforming to the world system and way of thinking. People get really religious and uh, uh, legalistic about uh, friendship with the world. They, they misunderstand that. Like you can't embrace and show love to the unbeliever because they're in the world. That's ridiculous. That, like you said, Brother Luke, it's about conforming to the world and the way it thinks. We should have a light shine. People, like you said, even though, even if you have a health issue, you're still saying, hey, I'm fantastic. You know, like that lady, that always blows my mind in scripture where her son died and she says, all is well. You know, it's a. Uh, so true what you said about letting your light shine, don't hide it under. Remember that little song, This Little Light of Mine? Mm -hmm. Don't hide it under a bushel, let it shine. And that's yeah. absolutely true. That's just a wonderful way of putting it. Mm -hmm. That's true. I don't know why they, this one sin, 
even if she got over it. Well, she still lost. So what did that accomplish? Nothing. Yeah. yeah. If we're going to require that she uh, stop being a lesbian in order to r remain her friend, uh, then okay, she stops being a lesbian. Or you, the next time you discover some other sin in her life, uh, you're going to go through her whole life, every sing single sin, you're going to lay down the law on her and say, you better stop that sin or I can't be your friend. Well, I think she has the right to, to ask you to look in the mirror. <laughs> do you think you've gotten rid of all your sins? Uh, if you do, you probably what we call practicing easy legalism. You know, you you water down the law so much so that you can pass the test. But uh, Jesus didn't water it down. He, he ratcheted it and tightened it, made it so strict that even a, a bad thought is a sin. Brother Luke, Steve asked, because he just got here. Well, he said, wait, she believes in God and Jesus, but she's still not saved. Am I missing something? Yeah. She said, but I don't know if I'm going to heaven. So she believes Jesus is a real person. And she believes in God, but she hasn't trusted him uh, for salvation. So she she hasn't believed the gospel. She's uh, gay and she's scared that she can't be saved because she's gay. And if that's the case, uh, then somebody needs to give her the good news of the gospel so that she can trust Christ and realize that's just a sin like any other. And even if she didn't, even if she stopped being gay, she's still a lost sinner and needs the grace of God. So when we say she believes in Jesus and God, she believes they exist, but she, she hasn't believed the gospel yet. She, she hasn't trusted Christ and what he's done for her. The, um, yeah, I can understand why Steve would uh, ask the question uh, because, but I did make the point, And if you didn't hear it, Steve, uh, th there is a difference between believing in God and believing in Jesus and what we believe for our salvation. That's why the, the Bible says in James that even the demons believe and yet they, they tremble. Uh, so the, the difference would be in someone who believes that God does exist, Jesus does exist, and even maybe much knowledge about Jesus, but they never believe that they're going to go to heaven and they have eternal life because Jesus paid for their sins, uh, because Jesus promised eternal life. So uh, until they reach the point that they, they uh, realize that uh, they have eternal life guaranteed to them by Jesus, it's settled, uh, and uh, then they don't really understand the gospel uh, uh, until they reach that point of understanding. Uh, you don't have to be a, become a theologian. I want to make sure everybody understands this because that there are some people that are saying that a person has to really study the Bible exhaustively and, and get all this deep understanding of all these fine points. Uh, and maybe then when you reach a point where you have this great deep understanding, uh, then you'll get saved. Um, but uh, we don't believe that a person has to have a great knowledge of theology. But we do say you just need to understand the gospel means good news. And the good news is that I'm going to go to heaven because Jesus promised it to me. Jesus accomplished salvation for me by paying for my sins. Uh, so that is, we're not we're not asking the people and are imposing a great uh, wealth of knowledge on theology, but we do insist that they understand that this good news is that they they do have the uh, the gift of eternal life, and it's guaranteed by Jesus, so it's settled. Uh, by the way, Steve, uh, I haven't seen you for a while, and now that you're 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 back in the in the fellowship with us, uh, uh, I see Brother Dave there. You ought to talk to Brother Dave. You, you too, I think, would have a a lot of fun uh, fellowshipping together. So, Brother Dave, meet Brother Steve if you haven't already. Uh, all right, uh, uh, Ben. We were together on my panel Thursday, uh, Saturday. It was a wonderful member. Dave and Steve were both on the panel, and uh, I, I oh, think. Oh yeah, that's, that's that's right. They were both there that night. Yeah, it's a I, good I, I, that's the one. On the, was that the one on the cuties? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't listen to it too long because, as I told you, I tried watching the program so to make a judgment, and, and, and it was really sickening from the beginning. But as as it got worse and worse, uh, after forty three minutes, I I've had enough. This is just. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only way a person could actually enjoy watching that is they'd have to be a pedophile. Yeah, there you go. Yep. 
Yeah. Yep. So um, I was so sickened by it. I didn't want to. I didn't want to listen to it. Even even to listen to people refute it was sickening to me. <laughs> That's how bad it was. Yeah. 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 I wanted. I wanted to be graphic. I wanted people to be offended and angered by it. Yeah. Righteous indignation. Yes. Okay, uh, brother Ben, did you want to pipe in on this question before we move to the next one? Well, you guys, there's really very little, you, there's nothing really to add to what you guys added, uh, said. It was brilliant. Um, the only thing I would mention, you said, Luke, that yes, don't become uh, friends with the world. But I, it, I think that's in James. And I think the context is they were elevating certain members of the church of, ahead of others based on their reputation and financial status and things like that. And he was rebuking them for being allowing the wor world to compromise and seep in in their thinking. And they, they wanted to go out, basically, you know, neglect the fellowship. And say, oh, well, I'm going to go out, you know, go out to the next town or travel far away to make a great profit in business. So it's just it's just a matter of compromising w with the world. Not uh, we're, we're not talking about co compromising with the world is one thing, but uh, going out into the world to be fishers of men is an entirely different one. So you guys answered that so so expertly. Okay, all right, thank you. I I see a comment by Hendrix that's confusing me, so I'm assuming that I'm not understanding it uh, right. Hendrix says, I love cuties. Saw it the other day and bought several, and there's a link at Sam's Club. I'm afraid to look at that link, Hendrix. Tangerines. It's tangerines. The cutie tangerines. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Be careful, Hendrix. We don't want anybody to think you're endorsing the, t the TV show cuties. All right. Um, okay, I guess we're ready to move on to question two. Um, Three-part question based on this verse. Acts 8.22 is when Peter says to Simon the sorcerer, Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Okay. Um, maybe we should go to that, but uh, we'll have to look up the verse and see the context, I'm sure. But a uh, three-part question says, first, is this telling us we've got to repent of our sins to get saved? Second, if all our sins are covered and we receive full forgiveness, past, present, and future for sins, once we accept the gospel, why does Peter say, perhaps, may be forgiven you? as if God might not forgive Simon because his sin was too great even after repenting. Uh, and third, uh, should of Peter uh, left out that word perhaps, or was Apostle Peter not speaking by the Holy Spirit, but just got totally into the flesh because of his indignation and disgust for what Simon did by thinking he could buy power from the spirit with money. My opinion is that Simon was not saved as he believed in Philip's preaching about the things concerning the kingdom, not specifically the gospel. That's why Peter had to come. Uh, and Peter was not being led by the flesh and was not making a theological factual statement, but used the word perhaps to make Simon change his mind or repent, so he'd see life and the gospel as being far more valuable than money and power. It's a deep question. There's a lot to it. Uh, Sister Renee? Yeah. Uh, well, here, here's an example of temporal versus eternal death. All right. So what's going on here? Let's look at what the scripture says. It says uh, there's a certain man called Simon. Uh, he used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria and acted like he was some great one, right? Uh, and then these people believe Philip, the people there, believe preaching things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So the, the Holy Spirit here they're talking about is not the seal that you receive once you believe on Christ. This is power 
of the Holy Spirit to heal and do miracles and signs and wonders because the apostles could lay hands on someone and then they had the anointing to also do the miracles. And this is what Simon wanted, but he wanted it for wicked purposes. He wanted it to look like he was some great one. And so he wanted to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit that seals us when we believe. It clearly says that Simon believed and was baptized. So I do not believe that he was lost. I believe this is a warning. He's going to drop dead. Like I believe Peter was warning him he's going to take your life. And there is a sense of urgency here. And if you see what happened with Ananias and Sapphira, it was no joke. They dropped dead. And, and God, God is glorified in this. And so he's warning him, this is wicked, what you're thinking, because he, he wants the power for the miracle. So he, as a sorcerer, can look like a great one, right? It's all for his own glory. He's still, he's, you know, he's a babe in Christ. He's completely in his flesh here. So Peter's warning him that God's going to strike his butt down. That's what's happening here, okay? He's going to lose his life early. And this is the terror that's come upon him. So when it says, um, again, Simon believed also and he was baptized, okay? But he didn't have the miraculous power, okay? He, he wanted the power to do signs and wonders that they were seeing here, all right? Because it says, uh, then laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. That's different than when we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, when we trusted Christ. This is an anointing of miracles that was passed from one to another by the laying on of hands. They laid their hands on him and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw the through laying of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered him money saying, give me also this power. Again, the power here was to do miracles uh, that on whomever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. See, he wanted to be able to be the one that gave people power and to do miracles and stuff like that. Uh, he had a wicked agenda. And Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Perish with thee. He's basically saying, you and your money go to hell. That's what he's saying. But he's not saying he's not saved and he's going to go to hell. He's telling him you're going to perish. You're, you're, you and your money be destroyed together, right? This is about physical life being threatened here. Look what he says. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven me. He's not saying forgive you for all of eternity. We got forgiveness through the shedding of Jesus' blood. We're already forgiven. This is temporal forgiveness because his life, Peter knows that all he's got to do is say, Lord, strike him down, and he will. So he said, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and says, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which you've spoken come upon me. Now, what was coming upon him? That him and his money would perish, that he would drop dead. So this is what Simon is asking. Hey, please uh, intercede with God for me because of this wickedness I did, because I don't want to die. That's all he's saying here. It has nothing to do with eternal forgiveness or eternal life. It's not saying that God rejected him and didn't give him the same salvation he offers anybody by his grace, but that he was a babe. He just got saved and he was in his flesh. His motives were all wrong and he was going to drop dead. So he's asking Peter, hey, pray, intercede for me so that none of these things come upon me. Do you see? It's here. It's temporal. These things don't come upon me. 
that the money in myself perish, that I die. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good answer. I think uh, we've had other talks about Simon the Sorcerer, and uh, there's kind of a split in terms of people who think he was saved or not saved. Um, but I, I think this is a, a, a place where people can learn that uh, uh, when we get saved, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that uh, uh, we understand every theological uh, issue and subject. Uh, uh, we got saved through the simplicity of the gospel, the, the cross, and uh, obviously. There was a lot Simon the Sorcerer didn't understand at the time. Uh, it says he believed and he got baptized and he believed the, the gospel that Philip presented. I, I think that's how it says. Let me see. I read that, I think, in the Amplified. Uh, um, says What verse is it, is it where he says he believed? Um, yeah, verse 13. Uh, then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, uh, he continued with Philip. But in the Amplified, verse 13 says, even Simon believed uh, Philip's message of salvation. So uh, I think it's safe to say when he believed, it, it means that he believed the gospel message that was given by Philip, and therefore he's a believer. Um, that, that should be a lesson to everybody, that when you become a believer, you, you're not, uh, you don't become uh, uh, an authority on, on Scripture. And you don't certainly have to become an authority on Scripture as a prerequisite in order to get saved. You just need to understand the simplicity of the gospel, uh, of uh, the, the faith, even childlike faith, and you're saved. But that means that uh, not only this guy, but all of us have had to go through a period where I'm saved, but there's so much I don't know. And even now, after studying since December of 1986, this is what uh, December will be 34 years, all these years of study, uh, I'll repeat what Einstein said, man doesn't even know 1% of nothing. So what do I know about the Bible? Well, probably more than most people, but uh, I there's so little I know compared to what there is to understand in the Bible. So I, I am ignorant of so much in the Bible, and I'm probably wrong about some of the things in the Bible, even after all this study. So thank, thank you, Lord. I'm glad that I didn't have to get it all figured out first. I'm glad I didn't have to figure it out perfectly and, and get it, everything lined up so that I'm infallible before I could get saved or as proof that I'm saved. And I think that's what's happening here. He has this simple understanding of the gospel and the salvation message, but he certainly didn't understand all the other things that were going on here with the Holy Spirit. And he obviously had a great desire, and maybe his, his motives were all wrong too. He wanted it because he, he saw somehow he was going to be able to profit from this. Maybe he would turn around and, and sell it. He would buy it. Then, then he would turn around and sell it. Obviously, that's all wrong. And that's uh, not only uh, was uh, to be uh, uh, criticized, and but forbidden. That's not not what we do. So he had a lot to learn. Did he go on and learn and get it all straightened out eventually? Uh, there's not a whole lot of a record about Simon in the Bible after this, but uh, there's there's historical records, and uh, there's on both sides of this argument. There are those people that argue that he he never did uh, get saved, but. Um, I, I don't ever see any reason not to believe it based on just what the scriptures tell us. Now, Renee, we did not answer the part of the question that was uh, about this word, um, perhaps. Uh, the questioner is making the distinction because, because Peter said perhaps, um, and where was it, 22? Uh, he says, repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So was there any doubt? Uh, since he says perhaps, is there any doubt that he would be forgiven by rip, rip of this uh, error? Uh, or, and was Peter saying perhaps because this is the word of God and God is telling him to say perhaps, 
Or was it, as Paul said sometimes, right now I'm not speaking for God, I'm just speaking for myself. So do you have anything you could say about the word perhaps, Sister Renee? Uh, yeah, that uh, <laughs> you better hope God don't strike you dead. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you repent of this right now, maybe God won't uh, take your life. That's what he's saying. He can't be sure. All he can do is say, hey, if you if you repent of this uh, wickedness, I can go to God and maybe he'll forgive you and not you won't perish. That's why he said, uh, pray to God and that none of these things come upon me. Peter can't say for sure what God's going to do. You know, mm -hmm. he can't know for sure if God's going to uh, uh, take his life or not. But if he repents, the odds are, you know, hey, maybe God won't kill you for this horrible thing you've done. Yeah, uh, I, that makes sense to me. The, I think that uh, the questioner is uh, uh, focusing a little too much on that word, perhaps, and making more of it than, than, he, than we should. I think you've you, uh, explained it just right. Um, all right, any more, Renee? Uh, I would just say a lot of people hate me because I say Simon was saved. Almost everybody, even free gracers, hate when I say that Simon was saved and this is temporal judgment. I don't know why, but a lot of people get mad at me for interpreting it. But when the Bible says Simon believed and was baptized, the Holy Spirit here is the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit to do miracles, not the seal of the Holy Spirit. So to me, it's clear he got saved. Well, to back you up, Renee, um, Again, I, I always believe, I, I'm convinced, you know, God doesn't leave anything ambiguous. He always puts clues in scripture to tell us exactly. And it's only someone who would has a pre-commitment to uh, their own private interpretation would they, would they not believe Simon was saved. Because, for example, the whole context, and you got, again, I, I see with scripture as a, almost like a song where you have to take the, every statement that was said before in that epistle or, or book uh, has to bear its full weight on the next verse. Uh, to, to properly understand it and um, a lot of people would like to take these almost like a note or a verse out of the song and try to make their own song out of it but you don't get to do that you got to take the whole song uh, it's a whole you, you got to take the whole thing together um, and in, in the the context clearly says that the, the, that believing it was the, believing the message that uh, Philip preached and they were baptized no one was baptized because they believed uh, that oh uh, Jesus was the Christ but they didn't believe that uh, he forgave them of their sins. Um, they they knew well and good that you were baptized because you were it was an outward reflection of an inward change or an inward belief of being born again and uh, being cleansed of your sins fully. And again, the context clearly says all through it, believe, believe, they all believed. But somehow they get to time and say, oh, no, his belief must be different when there's nothing in the context that suggests that at all. And in fact, it's it's what is that just like what Satan did in the garden? Did God really say Simon believed um, it? So that's a very dangerous, slippery slope. Furthermore, so that I think that's one uh, strike against people that would come against Simon was saved. Secondarily, uh, you know, uh, they said, repent. Peter said, repent, uh, let your money perish with you. So are these same people, same free gracers, are, are they now, if they're going to say this is a salvation context, are they now prepared to say that repentance of sin is a requirement for eternal life? Because that's that's how they have to interpret that verse, say yeah. uh, that that uh, God would forgive, perhaps God will forgive you. Yep. And, and, and you have to ask for God for forgiveness. So um, again, it's a pre-commitment. It's I think it's a poor hermeneutic, poor exegesis. And I think scripture says very clearly Simon was saved. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, again, they put their own experience in it. But people back then, again, hearing the message of grace, that was such a radical thing. A lot of us have heard about it. We might not have convinced about it, but convinced of it as an early age. But I think we all heard it, about it in the as a youth where these people back then, uh, the, grace was a totally foreign concept to them in terms of their relationship to God. And for them to understand it immediately and understand, uh, you know, the heart change that comes with that, to expect that immediate change uh i think is pushing it to an extreme so i i totally back you up and i think it's uh really an error to say he wasn't saved yeah that's true it's a slippery slope 
because now you're saying uh, uh, you got to have a clean heart and clean yourself up uh, for salvation if you want to take this verse in that context. And perish means destroyed. Uh, and in this case, it means he's going to drop, you're going to drop dead, bro. If, uh, because Simon here, he will, people were talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay. The difference is you receive the Holy Spirit. You're born of God. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. The moment you trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit here of laying on hands is not that this is to have the power to walk in the signs, wonders, miracle, and healing that was going on in that day. That's what they were laying their hands on. That's why Simon said, hey, give me this power so I can give it to others. But he wanted it for his own glory. We see in the beginning, he was doing sorcery to be some great one. <clears throat> so he wanted it for his own glory. And God is not going to share his glory with anyone. It doesn't say that the Lord won't save him. He saves anybody freely by his grace. It's clear that he believed and then he got baptized, but he still had this ulterior motive for wanting the power of the Holy Spirit, not the seal, not the spirit we get when we're born again, but an anointing, a special gifting of the Holy Spirit that allowed people to do miracles. That's what he wanted. And so uh, when Peter tells him, perhaps he'll, you know, it, the thing is here, your thoughts are so wicked. You're trying to steal glory from God. You need to repent of this right now and understand what the Holy Spirit is for. It's for God's glory to bring people to Jesus, not for you to show off to be some great one, as the scriptures say. And if you don't change that real quick, you're going to drop dead. And so I, I think it's clear here. This is temporal judgment. Just like Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, I heard uh, somebody the other day said, no, Ananias and Sapphira dropped right into hell. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Where do you get that? Where do you get? You put your own theology in here when scripture tells you clearly that you're saved by grace through faith in what Christ did. And what we do once we're saved is a matter of blessing, long life sometimes, uh, chastisement. And even it, and reward or loss of it, and even early death. John talks about sin unto death. So um, I, I think it's clear here. This is a threat to his physical life. That's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Well, I said earlier that I remember discussing this question, uh, this type of question about Simon uh, on a Friday night program. And we had quite a committee of people giving their thoughts on it. But uh, Renee, I think you really had the best answer I've heard explaining what was going on here with Simon. I, I think that was that was very helpful. Um, all right, let's. Uh, uh, well, let me uh, take talk for just a minute here about um, the the chat room and the, the rules and the protocol uh, that we've uh, established. Uh, um, be before we start every program, uh, or scrolled on the screen are a certain a set of rules that we've agreed to how we will conduct ourselves in the chat room, which is the chat room is just our internet version of being in a local church. Um, there, there's uh, certain things that uh, we, we don't allow. And uh, it's, uh, you know, personal attacks, condescension, rudeness, things like that. And what we do is we warn people and, you know, clarify that that's not allowed. Sometimes we'll next we'll have to time them out. And if it persists or if the person is, uh, is there to just stir up just, uh, uh, discord and cause divisions in the congregation, uh, we will have to remove the person and uh, ban them. We, this is not a place for people to come in and try to cause divisions in the church. Uh, and then, um, so, uh, and the, the final point on our protocols, is the very last point is that um, it doesn't matter who's doing this. If it was Renee or me or any person uh, in there, and we're in there and just 
stirring up trouble, trying to cause division, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, there's no exceptions. Nobody's allowed to do it without any exception. So that's important to everybody understand what's going on if you're paying attention to what's going on in the chat room. All right. Um, let's go to the next question. Um, question three is, uh, what is your explanation of the vine and the branches in John 15, 1 through 6? Especially when Lord Shippers use the argument in verse 6 that anyone who stops abiding, Jesus is thrown into hell. Oh, no, stop abiding, Jesus. Uh, it's a typo, I think. Anyone who stops abiding in Jesus, is what it, they should have said, is thrown into hell after this life is over. Uh, very briefly, in my opinion, uh, is this a comparison of the general character between true believers who will abide uh, as his disciples versus false believers who will one day stop abiding because they never believed like Judas Iscariot. This parable was meant to give them joy and comfort the disciples over Judas' shocking betrayal by proving to them that they can't be like Judas because apart from Jesus, they can do nothing, which includes the very act of believing and abiding. But if a true believer did appear to stop abiding, then the true believer would just be taken home to heaven early without any rewards. But false believers who predictably stop abiding do get thrown into the fire. All right, Renee. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to read all that. Give me just a second. Yeah. There's a lot there. We, we, this is a verse, of course, that comes out quite often that uh, we've talked about many times already in the past. Uh, abiding in the vine. Um, we, we had that come up again just last Friday, and I remember the answers, and I wasn't really quite satisfied with all the answers. I think Ben uh, uh, was, uh, did the best job of, of relating it to uh, the farming and what was going on with, uh, you know, uh, uh, trimming plants and and so on but Renee you did a video on that and I think that's the, that's the answer to this question and I think your, the points you made in the video were were very helpful so yeah. maybe there's a big uh problem with interpreting this you don't take things in a parable and make them literal like you don't get your theology from a parable like he cast into the fire he's going to throw you in hell no, this is a this is talking about literal vines and branches, and he's discussing how a a vineyard keeper uh, makes pro, uh, fruit more fruit produce, and how if the vine is producing a lot of fruit, he lifts it up, he cuts it so that you can produce more, and the one that doesn't hangs down, they dry up. And then he cuts them off and throws them in the fire. They're worthless. Okay. This is not saying uh, he'll throw you in the fire. People got to stop with this, putting literal interpretations on pieces of parables like this. Um, so he, here's the overall thing. I did a study on first century vineyards so I could understand what he's saying. Cause he used a lot of, uh, things that were going on in the first century Jewish life. Uh, and here, the, the main point of this is he's speaking to Jews and he's letting them know you can't do anything good. You can't serve God unless you're in me. Like you, you think you, you know, he said many times that you think you have eternal life through the scriptures, but they are which testify of me. Right. So the thing here is he's telling the Jewish people that you, you can't produce any fruit. But if you're in him and you serve the Lord, and you produce, and I believe this is about uh, not just good works, but other souls being saved, the gospel, right? That uh, when the vine gets heavy, and what's interesting in first century vineyards is they looked like a cross. These things that held up vines, they were like this, and they had one or two pieces of wood that went this way. And what would happen is when the vines got heavy with grapes, 
They would lift them up. So the more that you serve the Lord, the more the Lord himself lifts you up so that you can produce more for him. Okay. But if, and he talks about this in the, the parable of the talents also, that he who has uh, uh, much will be given more and he who has little, even that'll be taken away. It's saying if you don't use what God's give you, God gives you, and you don't serve him, that you're you're a, a wicked servant. You're uh, unuseful to him. Uh, and But the main point of this is to say that no one can produce anything unless they're in Jesus. Now, the command to abide in him is prior to the Holy Spirit. We don't have to try to abide in Christ. Because we're all once you're in Christ, you're always in Christ because the spirit has quickened you, brought your spirit back to life. So <clears throat> to tell somebody to hang in there, abide it is, you know, until the Holy Spirit comes. We don't have to try. But if we're talking about fellowship, abiding in Christ, we can do that with the helmet of salvation and the full armor of God, reminding ourselves what Christ did for us. But here. um, you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. This is prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, again, it's a warning to the Jews that they need to be in him. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bring forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Now, here is a, a, a truth. If a man not abide in me, abide not. You, you, first of all, you can't do anything. And if you're not in Christ, you are cast forth as a branch and is withered and cast into the fire. Absolutely. If you want to take this for salvation, if you are not in Christ, you are cast into the fire. But that's not what this is saying. This is not uh, talking about hellfire here. This is a parable using the vineyard and what men do comparing to service to God. Uh, man gathers them. Men, do men gather men and throw them into hell? No. Men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So what? why? Why are they burned? They're worthless. And so you'll see that branches that don't produce fruit, they end up getting, they, they hang to the ground. They're dried up. And so men cut them apart and throw them in the fire. They are worthless. They cannot produce. So uh, in one sense, yeah, if you're not in Christ, you can't do anything and you will be cast in the fire. But I believe this is clearly um, service and fellowship because he says, these things have I spoken unto you that joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Uh, if you remember first John, uses the same language. So people take first John out of context too, which is about fellowship with God and fellowship with others. So uh, here, I think a lot of people make the mistake of trying to take a piece of a parable and turn it literal and make it about salvation. Uh, when I think it's clearly uh, uh, about um, service, but it's also warning the Jewish people Hey, you, you can't do anything. You got to be in me. So in that, in that sense, you can apply it to salvation because unless you're in Christ, you can't produce fruit and you are worthless. I mean, you're, you're not in him. You can't do anything good. Uh, but this is clearly about fellowship and service. Uh, and so your joy might be full. Mm -hmm. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, I can't add anything to that. Uh, you can explain it better than I could. So uh, I'll go to the next question. Real quick, I, I look oh, mind. Go um, ahead. Just a, a, another point. I 100% agree with uh, Renee. And another point too is again backing it up a little bit further. He says, "Every branch of me who does not bear fruit, he takes away." Or that also could be translated as lifted up, like braced up, like he's actually helping you to grow. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So a lot of people, you know, may be willing to want to rest, uh, rest in their laurels. Like, I oh, I get a lot of work. Well, I think God will take that away from you, essentially. Not not take it away from you, but allow you to uh, remove that burden. Or you may be already grown enough in that area, so he'll move you into another area of growth. Um, 
it, but the first three, I think, is, is the clincher. It says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. That's almost word for word what he said to Peter uh, when Peter said, uh, no, Lord, you will not wash my feet. He says, no, if, if, you don't, if, I don't, if you don't allow me to wash my feet, you have no part in me. And uh, basically part of, of his ministry and fellowship and service. But you, but you are already clean. So who, who has uh, already been clean only needs a bath but is already clean is what he says. Uh, but not all of you are clean, and he was referring to Judas because he was a devil. So again, I think it, it's almost a, a direct parallel to what he said to Peter. And in that uh, ver in that context, he's referring to that cleanliness or be, have been completely clean because of the word spoken to them. He was clean in terms of being sprinkled by the blood, washed by the Holy Spirit, justified in the sight of God. But Judas was not. Um, but again, he did, they needed uh, to allow Christ. They needed to f abide in God's word to allow that to the, cleanse them on a daily basis, essentially, which is basically, I think, what the, the principle is here in John 15, where he's saying, yes, abide in me, abide in my word, continue to learn from me. You don't know everything that you need to know yet. Uh, yes, you know the essentials, you're saved, but you need to continue to grow in me and abide. And uh, But you are you are already clean. And again, I think it's a, a, people that use that as a, uh, the Lordship ver use those verses Again, they wrench them right out of context. Uh, they twist, they twist these verses and shout it. It's Chubby Checkers uh, human, hermeneutics. <laughs> twist and shout. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, I'll go ahead to the next question. If there's no more on that, uh, is martial arts wrong? I ask this because some use the argument to say we should not do martial arts because there are spiritual elements incorporated into the moves, especially with katas and at the higher levels. Then I uh, use the argument that a lot of styles of martial arts, especially the Chinese and Japanese ones, are based on their religion like Buddhism and using the energy of the spirit realm to increase the power of your moves. Some Christians go as far as to say that we should never, ever do any type of self-defense or even boxing, as this teaches violence, and we should just rely on the Lord to protect us. Or any, or another um, uh, lot of Christians say that martial arts is wrong, but if you want to learn self-defense, do those sports which don't have any spiritual element like boxing and wrestling. What do you think? Sister Renee? Yeah, this is important to me because as you guys know, I worked with martial arts movie stars for 20 years. Uh, I was a line producer, a unit production manager of many martial arts projects. Uh, you know, I worked on Bloodsport 2 and 3, uh, 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 Truth and Consequences. Uh, I worked uh, on the Encyclopedia of Martial Arts. I, I worked with almost every major martial arts star. So this is close to my heart. I have a lot of martial arts uh, movie people that are now saved. Uh, so here, here you go. I'm going to look at this with a common sense approach and, and, and a truthful one. All right. There, when I did the encyclopedia of martial arts, I worked with a Qigong master uh, uh, named Master Zhou, uh, Z-H-O-U. Uh, he could do some miraculous things. Uh, he literally burned me with his hand. Uh, he moved a plant across the room with the energy from his hand. He, uh, I can't tell you some of the other things he did, but he, uh, he was using some energy uh, that I, you know, now I'd be a little uncomfortable with because as you said, it is uh, going back to some of their spiritual beliefs. However, uh, martial arts itself, uh, if you take the spiritual element out, it, it's just a mind focusing. It's to get your mind, breath, and body uh, working together. And it's to use, uh, real martial arts is to use the other person's negative energy against them. You're not using your own. You don't draw forth energy from yourself to push out. It's only used in defense. And if I hadn't known it, I'd be dead. I wouldn't have escaped the two men in the back of the car. So, yeah, 
I'm for uh, self-defense because I'm living proof of it. I mean, it's the grace of God I lived after, you know, contracting the MRSA from them and everything. But I wouldn't have got out of the back of that car if I couldn't fight. So, uh, no, I, I have no problem with it. I think that we need to be careful when we get into some of their spiritual practices. Uh, we don't want to move over into Hinduism with the yoga because yoga means to yoke with. And when you do these poses, you are calling forth a specific spirit to you. That's different. And a Hindu uh, religious leader will tell you flat out that is how that is a, a form of prayer. It is a form of worship and it is not exercise. You cannot Christianize that. OK, because each form that you do is calling forth a specific spirit. However, in martial arts, if you use it to just control the breath, to calm the mind and to focus uh, your body, I, I think it's healthy. But again, you can go too far in either direction. You can be afraid of everything and oh, it's of the devil. Uh, and then you can go too far. Uh, into the spiritual practices that you don't want. So martial arts is one of those things, uh, self-defense that can be used to help a person. I've seen a lot of people, uh, you know, start doing that and they're, they're, they're more calm, they're healthier physically. I, I mean, I had Jim in karate when he was young because I, I saw, you know, what it did for me. And, um, I, I don't, I'm not one of these people that everything's of the devil. You know, you can, you can take anything too far. Now I, I already know there's going to be clips of me saying this, I'm going to be accused. Uh, and that's okay. But, uh, stay away from the spiritual principles of Buddhism and so forth. But you know, all the martial artists I know that they're, they're Christian, like, Eric Lee, he's the weapons and kata champion of the world. He's a Christian. Don the Dragon Wilson, he's a Christian. I mean, the uh, Art Camacho, he's a Christian. So all these uh, guys are Christian. They're not Buddhist, and they don't do any of those spiritual practices, but they're excellent martial artists. So, uh, no, I don't think it's of the devil. I think martial arts is fine. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, sister. All right. In my life, I've, I've uh, had a handful of interests that I've um, really uh, immersed myself or really focused on, and, and martial arts is one of those things. I, when I uh, got in college my first year, I joined a fraternity, and one of the fraternity brothers owned a karate school, and he offered free karate classes to anybody in the fraternity. Uh, and uh, I was in college on a tennis scholarship, and I was athletic. So uh, when I joined it, I excelled quickly because most people were not very athletic. They're, they're taking it because they were, you know, the, that term, the 98-pound weaklings. And, and so the majority of people are taking it because they've, they've been bullied and they're trying to learn how to defend themselves. So, But uh, I was an athlete, so I, I uh, learned quickly and, and excelled in it. Um, I, and maybe because of that, uh, my interest grew, and I ended up eventually advancing through not only that karate, but taekwondo, and then eventually boxing and kickboxing and jujitsu and all, the whole realm of martial arts. I, it, there's a term that everybody knows about today called mixed martial arts. Um, th that term didn't exist back when I was um, um, for the first half of my martial arts uh, life, but uh, uh, what I did was mix them anyway. I was, see, there's a school of thought in martial arts where you, you get into a style and you are devoted to that style and it would be, it's very much forbidden for you to engage in any other style because you're, you remain loyal to your, your style. We, we you taught that your style is the best and your it's superior. And, uh, so, um, that's that's your traditional viewpoint that you stick with one form of martial arts. Uh, uh, but me, I was curious, and I ended up getting involved in all of them. And I naturally started blending them together, trying to take the best elements of each. And uh, eventually, if you if you do that long enough, you develop your own style. 
of our preferred uh, methods. But so that's been my history. And, and until the last few years where my health has uh, been uh, prohibited me from doing all it to the extent, I still do some, but I can't nearly do all the things I used to do. But it's been a lifelong interest for me that I pursued. Now, regarding the uh, uh, mystical parts of it and the religious parts of it, um, in America, that's not really that common to have that part of the training. Uh, of course, other places, in, like in Japan or China, of course, probably Buddhism would be incorporated into it, meditation and that kind of a thing. So that is a, is a, a concern. But in the U.S., it's mostly done uh, apart or from that uh, spiritual aspect of it. Uh, but as far as tr learning to defend yourself, I think that we have a right, uh, maybe even a duty, to, to learn how to not only defend ourselves, but to defend others when the time comes. Um, but the best, uh, the best approach is uh, to avoid the conflict. Well, if someone asked me, now I, I've had to use my martial arts uh, techniques on people over the years a, a few times, but um, most of the time I've been able to avoid it. And, and someone asked me once uh, years ago, well, when's the last time you had to use your martial arts? And I said, well, I did earlier today uh, uh, when I was parking my car. I parked in a, in a place that was uh, going to be visible to everybody, so I couldn't be in a, you know, off in a corner where there's no lighting and 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 be jumped because the boogeyman really is out there, and they they love the darkness, so they can sneak up on people. So I, I said, yeah, that's martial arts. Martial arts is learning how to prevent the attack and avoid the attack. That's probably the most valuable thing you can learn in martial arts, uh, and then if it can't be avoided knowing how to uh, at least strike enough so that you can escape uh, is the next thing that a person. So I, I do endorse it. I don't think there's anything wrong with defending ourselves. Obviously, if we can turn the other cheek, if we, that means do whatever we can to avoid it. But there does come a point where we are entitled and to defend ourselves. And I would say that applies even more so if you, you have to defend someone else. All right, uh, any more Renee or Ben? I, I do want to say, you know, I'm not going to judge anybody on this stuff. People get real legalistic about it. Uh, I personally have issues with a couple of them because they, their origins are so steeped in the religion of Buddhism and Hinduism and Hinduism. Buddhism is Hinduism. Uh, Buddha was a Hindu. He, it's just a sect of Hinduism. So here's the thing. I'm not going to judge anybody on any of it. I have some, personal issues with some of the styles because i i i know what they're for they're for meditation they're for yoking with deities and stuff like that but honestly uh ben ben was right to the pure all things are pure but to the defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure even their conscience is defiled so you know god knows your heart so i'm not going to get all legalistic on it but as far as martial arts uh it saved my life more than once so I'm 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 glad I can kick butt, even mm -hmm. as a cripple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know we're all thankful you you survived that ordeal. That was a quite a, a nightmare you went through. Uh, all right, uh, uh, Ben, did you want to say anything about this? That foot in the guy's throat in the back of the car was a nightmare too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he got a quite a surprise, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> he grabbed the wrong woman to pass <laughs> in the back of the car. <laughs> All right, Ben, uh, do you have anything to say about this one? No, you guys covered it perfectly. Okay, perfectly. Awesome. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, I think maybe we have time for another one. Uh, number five is uh, we know that the unforgivable sin is a concept rather than a one-off uh, single act. Um, such as the unforgivable sin is to speak against the Holy Spirit by your actions, and actions are considered like words to God. Uh, by never accepting the gospel, as that is the ultimate insult to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, as lordshippers reject the gospel because they think it causes people to sin, 
uh, they are saying that the truth causes you to sin, calling it evil, and even call faith alone in Osas a doctrine of demons, or atheists think it's stupid, calling the spirit a liar, etc. Yet Mark 3, verse 30, in regard to the unforgivable sin, says, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. If this sin isn't just saying something malicious, why does it say the words, because they said? There are there are used to be a lord shipper who used to troll on Renee's channel all the time last year on every video and used to always throw that verse up and make this argument. Hey, Renee. Yeah, okay. I did a video a while back and said, you can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit unless you're a time traveler. And uh, in a sense, that's true. Now, the warning here is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event. We need to be clear on that. It's not a one-time event. Whether we're looking at it biblically here or ultimately, the only thing, let, let me be clear, the only thing that makes a person lost is rejecting the once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is it. It's the only unforgivable sin. Why is that? Because you have no savior. You have no blood that cleansed you from sin. That's the only, the, the, all sins forgiven except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because you don't have the blood to cover your sin because you've rejected the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Now here, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to these Pharisees that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Son of God. But instead of believing it, even though God's showing them these miracles and his power, they want to reject him. He doesn't look like they want him to look. So they're going to find another excuse to why he has this power. And so they put his power and give credit to the devil. That is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's rejecting the witness the Holy Spirit's giving you of Jesus. And so what these people did, uh, and it said, then was one brought unto him, one possessed of a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him. So the blind kid can see and speak and the spirit left him. Okay. They witnessed this in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. So this was signs and wonders, healings that were visibly, I mean, what more proof do you need? The, the prophet said that he would come with these miracles. Okay. Now, instead of saying, hey, he's the one, this is who we're waiting for. He fulfills the scriptures. No, they don't like how he looks. They're self-righteous. They think he's a child of fornication and they cannot see. And so instead of receiving the witness of the Holy Spirit, they reject it. They blaspheme him and give credit to the devil for the work he's doing. And all the people were amazed and said, is this not the son of David? See that? Everybody else knew that the son of David, the promised Messiah, would come with these miracles, but the Pharisees refused to see it. But when the Pharisees heard it, heard what? Hey, this is the Messiah, the son of David, the promised one. No, 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 we don't care. We don't like it. We don't like him. He doesn't look like Solomon and all his riches. We want somebody else. So we reject him and we reject what the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to. This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. See, they're saying the devil cast out the devil. So here's the thing. The only thing that's unforgiven is to go to your grave without receiving Christ. That is blaspheming the Holy Spirit because he says that he'll draw all men unto himself. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to who Jesus is. It said it'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So these people rejected him and Jesus warned not that, not that this was a one-time event, but if they kept blaspheming the Holy Spirit, 
if they kept seeing the miracles and go, no, it's not of God. No, you're not the one. No, we don't like you. No, it's of the devil. If you keep blaspheming, eventually it's going to be too late. God's going to, you keep rejecting him. God's done with you. He's not showing you any more proof. You keep rejecting it. And so that was the warning Jesus gave these Pharisees. If you keep blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be able to come back from this because God's going to show you all these miracles. How many times? How much does he have to show you? And you always find an excuse that it's something else. You see this with atheists sometimes. Oh, it's aliens. Oh, it's even if God wrote in the sky, hi, it's me, Jesus. I would just say it's aliens. So no matter what you show them, they won't see it. And so they go to their death blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's why it's unforgivable because they have no they have no savior. And ultimately that's all this is. Again, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is not something you do once. It's the continual rejection of the Holy Spirit bearing witness of who Jesus is. So uh, if you want to take it in the biblical context here, where they give the devil credit for God's power, uh, that can't even be done now unless, you know, somebody's working a miracle and, and you say that the devil did it or something. But uh, the only reason anybody's lost is rejecting Christ. And that is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Oh, excellent job. You're giving some, obviously, um, I, you always give good answers, but today your answers are really just pinpoint accurate, oh, right? great you. answers. Um, I guess there's two ways people uh, answer this, and, I, and I've uh, thought of it both ways, and I, I'm, I'm not sure which is one, if one way is better than the other, and you did cover, cover it. Uh, the first way, of course, is that uh, it would actually be impossible to do it today because if we read the context, uh, uh, this is uh, Jesus is alive. He is performing miracles uh, through the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And yet the Pharisees are accusing of him of, of, of having the devil uh, and, and, not, and, and his miracles are not done by God. But it's uh, demonic. Beelzebub, uh, they say, is in him. Um, now, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit according to the context. But um, is it possible for any of us to do that today? Um, I, I don't, unless we were able to actually go back in time, physically be there, physically witness Jesus doing the miracles, and then and then accuse him of not having the Holy Spirit, but instead having Beelzebub, that's the only way you could do it within the context that we read about it. Uh, and so that in that way, it would be impossible today. Uh, they had they did it then. They were accusing him of having the devil in him. Uh, and, and basically, it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is doing the miracles, and yet they say, no, it's not the Holy Spirit, it's the devil. Uh, but the... The, the way that um, the reason people relate it to the gospel and being a believer uh, is because it says it's the only thing that's unforgivable. It, and so, well, what do you mean? There's only one thing that's unforgivable. Uh, didn't he pay for all of our sins on the cross? So is there something that's unforgivable? Uh, and then through deduction, we, we realize that, well, there is only one thing that will, uh, it is... Uh, Let's say you can say it's unforgivable, but you can say that I think a better way of saying it is that uh, there's one thing that will prevent you from having eternal life and, and, and heaven. Uh, and that is if you never believe and receive the gift of eternal life. Uh, so if you don't believe the gospel, uh, that's and that will result in um, this uh, this problem of uh, it's not really blasphemy of the Holy Spirit the way that we have it in the context, but the result is this is one thing that's unforgivable. Um, and I think your point about it being uh, not a one-time event uh, is important because there has been um, challenges uh, in uh, recent times. People make videos and uh, say, I challenge you to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So it's atheists mocking our faith 
and they they say I'll, I'll blaspheme the Holy Spirit because they don't believe. Uh, yeah, you know, they don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in God. They don't believe any of this is real. So they think they can just blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and, and uh, they're not afraid of it. But that's not really, as you said, it's not a one-time thing. It's just throughout your life, you've you've considered, you always rejected it, and that's and that's what it is going to be the uh, unforgivable then. Yeah, Renee. Yeah, even with the Pharisees, it wasn't a one-time thing. Jesus kept warning, "Hey, you got to keep doing it." You know, like how many times is is the Holy Spirit going to show you uh, proof that you just keep rejecting? So, and when these these silly contests go on. Uh, daring people to blast that that shows how illiterate of scripture they are even in their stupid rebellion they can't get it right because in god's grace if they'd simply even if they say i blaspheme the holy spirit again like you said it's not a one-time thing god could easily save them by his grace and they could be savable no matter how many times they did that on camera i've seen teenagers do that i think it was in the god delusion i think uh uh, Richard Dawkins uh, got people or, or somebody that followed Richard Dawkins or something got people to do this challenge maybe Christopher Higgins I'm not sure but I've seen him grow up now and some of them are scared am I am I lost now because they did it as a teenager because they don't understand what that means they think it's something you can do once I, I don't think there's mm -hmm. anything you can perform one time that's just unforgivable to God mm -hmm. you know it's just mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't hear that mentioned very often. Uh, matter of fact, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody express it that way, but I, I think that is the, the defining point, is that uh, it's not a one-time thing uh, because people, that's how they're interpreting it, and therefore they can issue this challenge, hey, let's blaspheme the Holy Spirit and mock it, mock God. Uh, yeah, Ben? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to add, if you don't mind, I, I have a couple quick hits on this verse because I studied it ad nauseum. I strained every gnat out of it um, and because it does trouble people, and I think it keeps people unsaved. And I plan to do a video on this more exhaustively, but if you don't mind, I'll give you a couple quick hits of best back of everything you guys said. Um, I think, it, first of all, it's important to, under, to understand that it's not an unpardonable sin. It's an unpardoned sin. And, uh, you know, tradition and commentaries are what put it unpardonable sin. There's nothing the Bible says it's unpardonable. Um, that's that's man putting his, that's that's ice to Jesus. Um, and if you look at the context with all the context, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, again, context is king. Uh, just like real estate, location, location, location. You got to look at that first and see what's the surrounding context. And the context is, it, it's in Matthew, I think it's in Matthew 12. Um, if you look at the context, Jesus is, is giving illustration after illustration of mercy over condemnation law. So he's basically teaching them tr mercy triumphs judgment. So mercy, grace, who Christ personified is mercy. God's grace and mercy personified tr tr trumps or triumphs over mercy or I'm sorry, over condemnation, which the law brings. But they would not see that. They were blind to it. And so he gets them illustration after illustration. So the first illustration is. He, uh, his disciples were uh, eating uh, grain on the Sabbath, and uh, he says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, um, and essentially that, you know, they, they were doing God's work on the Sabbath, and they were hungry, so uh, again, there's something, there's some, the, it's talking about the spirit of the law, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the law, so he was saying, uh, well, that that's what the law says, and they're not breaking the law, because the, the law points to something greater. And that, in fact, that's a, a big, a major mega theme in Matthew 12. He's teaching something greater is here. Con, you know, the law is passing. Something greater is here now. For example, he says like uh, uh, the Queen of Sheba came, uh, you know, a great distance to learn the wisdom of Solomon. And yet God himself is right in your presence and you still won't hear him. Something greater is here and you still won't listen to him. To him. Same with, same with uh, 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 Jonah. Um you know, uh, so that's a major uh, mega theme. Then he goes into saying, "Okay, that, so the uh, the eating of the uh, grain on the sun uh, on the Sabbath was sh showing an act of mercy. The, the law points to something greater, which is mercy, and that was an illustration by eating grain on the Sabbath. Um, and then he moves into the next episode where he says, uh, do "You not do you not understand? Uh, David ate the showbread that was not lawful for him, but again, it was an act of mercy. But they didn't see it for that." And that's why he says to them, 
uh, go and learn this. Go and learn what this means. I prefer uh, mercy over sacrifice. They never learned that lesson. They saw the law again. The heart sees what it wants to see. So uh, a believer who wants to see condemnation looks down on others. That's what they'll get out of the Bible. Someone who is a pure heart uh, that, that comes in with a humble heart. Not uh, you know. Re not God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. And so they were proud, so they got condemnation. Um, also, another illustration is. Um, you, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, what he says there, he says, every sin and blasphemy. And when he says every, he means every sin. And when he says blasphemy, he means every blasphemy, including the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And he says, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven the sons of men. But, that he puts a but, and that's basically, take that line, that's the, that's grace, and then go to the next, drop down one line on, in the sentence, and he starts out with but. And it's not except, but it's but. So but and except are two, two different things. He's not saying except if you do this sin. He's saying, but he who blasphemes the Holy Spirit does not have forgiveness. Uh, he does not have it right now. He remains subject to the law. In fact, if you look in Matthew 12, where we see all those verses where he says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Uh, whoever commits adultery, whoever calls his brother a fool, all those uh, all those lessons are talking. He's, he's, he's amplifying the law and saying, this is what the law really teaches. This is the spirit behind the law, essentially. And all those condemnation verses where he says, if you do these things, he says you know, unequivocally, if you do those things, you're going to be cast into hell. And uh, But yet we know there's something greater than that, and that's God's love and mercy. But if you read those sentences where he talks about, uh, you know, he who commits adultery, uh, hates his brother, is a murderer, uh, calls a brother a fool, all those uh, sayings use the word, he is subject to eternal condemnation or answerable to the con condemnation. He's answerable to the law. And that same word, answerable or subject to, is used in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So he who blasphemes the Holy Spirit is subject to the law. Why? Because he's done, he's not been born again by the Spirit. He's under the law. He's not under grace. He's under the law. So that's why he's subject to it. And they were saying Christ was unclean, that he had an unclean spirit. And it, it's interesting that Christ said, it's okay to call the Son of Man unclean, but to say the spirit is unclean, that's un, that's that will keep you that will keep you remaining under the law because um, the spirit is what washes you and regenerates you. But but saying Christ was physically unclean, that was okay because again, that was not a, a matter pertaining to the spirit. That was a matter pertaining to the flesh. But saying that the Holy Spirit was unclean, well, that will keep you unsafe because that's the very agent that cleans you and washes you. Um, and also, too, right after that, he says, make the tree good or make it evil. So even when he said that to them, he was not saying you, 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 you've already self-condemned yourself. You, 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 you've done something that's going to keep you unsafe forever. You locked your faith. He's not saying that at all. In fact, he gives them another opportunity. He says, make the tree good or make it evil. Um, the uh, Also, too, like I mentioned, it's very formulaic in Scripture where you'll see great, in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, you see pure grace. And then, then the next sentence will, will say, but, and it'll give you the curses of the law. And you see that even in, uh, I saw that in Exodus. When I was reading the Bible for the first time, I was reading Exodus, and it stuck out like a sore thumb. And it seemed like it didn't bother anyone else but me. But I read in Exodus where, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, going off memory. He says, uh, Moses, the Lord passed before Moses. He says, the Lord, the Lord, abounding in grace, mercy, forgiving iniquity for generations and generations. He's, it, it's just pure grace. But, and then he says, but. The guilty, well, hang on, <laughs> to be forgiven, that means you've already, we're guilty. You, 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 you don't forgive someone that's not guilty of something. But he says, but he doesn't forget the guilty. Uh, and so it was it was a paradoxical statement. It was a clear contradiction. I was like, wow, maybe the Bible is riddled with errors, just like everyone says. But I said, no, there's no way the Bible would contradict itself in the very same sentence. Um, and, and so, But that's the exact the same formula you see with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's the exact same formula you see in Revelation 22 at the very end where it says, Come, come, whoever, whoever wants to take the water of life, come freely. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And then right after that, that's the promise. So he bas it's basically an invitation. Become a promise of, become, become a, a, a child of promise. Uh, be washed by the Holy Spirit. Become a, be, become a member of the bride. But right underneath it says, but anyone who um, adds to these words or takes away from these words 
God will take away his part in the tree of life, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that, again, that's a very formulaic, formulaic thing in the Old Testament and the ancient world where they had these boundary stones. And it, I, this is, again, I, 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 there's no way I came up, this, up to myself. But I saw when I read Revelation, they go, this is a spiritual boundary stone where the a king like Pharaoh would uh, grant a piece of land to his family members. Um, and he put, he, he put a boundary stone there and basically he would say, uh, in no uncertain terms, I'm granting this land. Again, grant is a word for basically grace. I'm granting this land to my son or to whatever uh, my co-ruler uh, that's going to co-rule with, rule with me. Uh, and underneath it, they would invoke the curses of the gods for any outside interferer that would try to uh, tamper with the legality of that promise. And so, again, it's an invitation uh, to become uh, a be washed by the spirit but if you remain outside you're you know instead of becoming a child of god you're going to remain your, you're going to remain as an enemy if you uh forsake the holy spirit and the holy spirit was witnessing christ's words were witnessing uh that he was from the father and his works by the holy spirit was witnessing that he had the power of god uh and that he was god um and let's see it's just, oh and also in the context he's talking about the what comes out of your mouth defiles you. Well, what were they doing? They were defiling themselves by showing what was inside their heart. And what was inside their heart, they loved They loved condemnation. And that's why they uh, did not see the Holy Spirit. And, and that's why he said, by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Well, no believer is going to be justified or condemned by their words. But someone under the law certainly will be. Um, and then also, too, uh, like Renee said, um, I believe it, this was at the apex. This happened right at the apex of Christ's ministry. So right at the beginning of the ministry of Matthew, you read, he's talking about he's the fulfillment of the law. He teaches what the law really looks like. He's talking about the kingdom and the right to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Oh, and prior to that, he kept offering the kingdom of God is at hand. Right after the Holy Spirit blasphemy, you no longer hear the, ki the ki kingdom is at hand. The kingdom offer was withdrawn from that point. And is on, I believe it's it's being postponed for a later date when they do believe, um, and when they cry out to mercy for him. Um, and I also see that too as a parallel. When I, I, it's almost like Christ is saying to them, "This, you know, I think he I, I, essentially I think he is saying to them, hey, you're you're not going to believe.' And so this is I'm, I'm saying this to you now. It's just like in Revelation, I believe. And, and Renee also said this was when Christ was doing all these miracles, showing the witness. Well, in Revelation, at the end of Revelation, there's the world's going to see plague after plague after plague, supernatural plague after plague after plague. Again, I think it's, it's kind of like you know, for God first came as a, as an agent of mercy or come, come as a, a, you know a gentle, humble servant, and he did miracles. Well, when he comes back, he's going to come back as a conquering king, and that's where some of the plagues come into place, and they're going to see the supernatural plagues. Uh, irrefutable evidence uh, that uh, the angel from heaven who denounces these plagues are of God, um, and yet they're going to reject that. And that's where you see, uh, again, I see a parallel where God says, okay, let, he was filthy, let him be filthy still. There, there, it's basically a point of, of no return, essentially. Okay, well, you pretty much sealed your fate because there's nothing else that's, there's nothing else that's going to convince you. You've been given all the light that anyone could ever hope for, and it's just a cosmic unbelief. Um so again, I, I've studied these verses, and it's not a one-time event. It's you've got to read it in context, um, and it, this verse gives me no trepidation whatsoever anymore, um, and it should not give any believer or unbeliever really any heartache at all either. Anyone can uh, you could blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Basically, means you're you're saying it. It you know it's not a one-time event. It, it's just like if you uh, murder your brother or you hate your brother one time, does it keep you from heaven? If you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, does it keep you from heaven? Um, again, you kind of, I think we need to be consistent with our her hermeneutic, and I, I believe Scripture reveals that it, it, we're justified in doing so. So that's all I'll say for now, but I hope that, uh, again, I think this verse keeps a lot of people unsaved, so it, it, uh, it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. thank okay, thank you, brother. Some very good insights there I hadn't heard before. Uh, Renee, any more on this? Uh, yeah, just that, you know, I just want to reiterate that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not something somebody should be scared of doing. <laughs> like a lot of people, did I blaspheme the Holy yeah, Come on. Uh, no. If you're worried about it, uh, you have it. You know, uh, it, again, it's something that's repeatedly done, resulting in you ultimately rejecting the gift of eternal life through Christ. So, no, you have it. Don't worry about that. So many teachers trying to instill fear 
and fear has torment and it's not of God. And he doesn't give us that spirit of fear. He, he puts the spirit in us that we cry, Abba, Father, he's our dad. And we need to get this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, we got through all five of the questions. Uh, I guess uh, it's time now to start uh, summing things up. Um, let me start with uh, Brother Ben. Uh, could you give us your summary of the study today? Yes, a lot of great questions, a lot of difficult questions, frankly, and I loved everyone's answers. Um, I think we all, we all pretty much agreed on uh, everything, and uh, and that's 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 not required, but uh, it's always um, a good thing. I, I mean, it, it makes me happy, um, and I, I really enjoyed the fellowship, and I loved the the, the comments in chat. They were really interesting as well, very uh, lively, um, and I uh, looked I look forward to next week. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sister Renee, uh, did you want to give the gospel message today? Sure. I love that. Okay. All right. Then uh, go ahead and give us your summary and, and then the gospel message. Sure. Well, uh, really thought out questions. They had, you know, a, a lot of parts to them, but they worked together. Uh, I appreciate when you put, you know, hey, a lot of people believe this. This is what I think. What do you guys think? I like that because it shows us what the other side believes this is, and it gives us a chance to straighten it out or untwist it. So uh, I really like that. You know, we've got to uh, look at scripture and determine, just pull out of scripture what's there. Don't put these preconceived theological issues into the scriptures. And not everything is about eternal damnation or redemption. You know, God cares what's going on in this world, too. So there's consequences on this earth. It's not just, you know, everything's eternal. Uh, God's not willing any should perish. That's why he makes salvation simple. And Jesus obtained it for us. It has nothing to do with us. He, The second Adam was more powerful and he fixed what the first Adam lost. But most people, for some reason, think the first Adam's. Uh, more powerful that his fall was more powerful than the redemption that is in Christ, which is sad. Speaking of that, bad news is that all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. As a matter of fact, all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You got you got no chance. So snowball's chance in hell of getting into heaven on your own. So the good news is Jesus fixed that. He knew that we were all without hope and lost without him. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So bottom line, we see all through scripture where the blood, the blood is received on behalf of the sin of man. And we see that a spotless lamb was inspected by the priest, the lamb was brought on behalf of the sinner. So the man would bring the lamb, and I did a video on this. The priest does not inspect you. The priest does not inspect the sinner to see if he's worthy. He inspects his lamb. And by the way, our lamb is without spot or blemish. Our lamb was perfect and accepted by God on our behalf so because our lamb was worthy and his blood was accepted to pay for our sin there is nothing that can condemn you you would have to make god a liar pull yourself out of jesus's hands and the father's hands you would have to refute what paul said that nothing could separate us from the love of god in christ you'd have to find something that can separate us from the love of god in christ then you'd have to say Jesus is a liar because he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Uh, so you'd have to find a way where Jesus would forsake us. Uh, Jesus said he would lose nothing. So you'd have to change the scriptures to say he'll lose some maybe. Uh, and you'd have to do a lot of other things. You'd have to take salvation out of God's hands and put him into your own. You'd have to do a lot to be lost. And you can't do any of that. That's how secure your salvation is. 
you you either trust the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He paid your sin debt in his own blood, offered his blood on the mercy seat of heaven. He ever liveth to make intercession for us and gave you the gift of eternal life. The only thing that would send you to hell is sin. That's what separates us from God. But we have been reconciled to God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to pay uh, on the cross. I'm only paying for Ben's sin up to the age 35. The rest is on him. It's just ridiculous how people limit his blood. So Jesus by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. You trust that what he did for you paid your sin debt and gave you eternal life, reconciled you to God, or you do not. And uh, I hope you do because there's great promises of an inheritance. And when you trusted Christ, if you trusted him, that he saved you, because the Savior didn't fail people. If you trusted that he saved you, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, meaning it's the down payment, a security that the remainder will be paid afterwards. So you'd also have to find a way to give back the down payment and be unborn and all kinds of other unbiblical nonsense to lose your salvation. Because once you're saved, you're in God's hands and he's never going to let you go. Greatest news ever, guys. Good to see you. What a beautiful, beautiful gospel message, sister. Um, it truly is simple and it's easy. All you got to do is believe it. So... God did his part by providing salvation for you, and your part is to receive it through faith. So thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Um, all right. Well, I enjoyed the, the time with everybody again today. Uh, uh, the next uh, thing on the schedule would be Wednesday night's uh, Bible study. Uh, that's 930 Eastern time uh, on the same channel. Uh, we're in uh, now of the book of Ephesians, so join us for that. And then uh, Thursday night, join Sister Renee for her Thursday night throwdown. Do you have anything scheduled for that yet, uh, Renee? We don't know what the topic will be Thursday, but we will have something. All right. And again, I want to congratulate WTOM's son for his baptism today. Yes, that's awesome. Okay. Well, that's it for today. Thank you, everybody, for participating Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.